A, the cheese touch. I noticed not long ago that even though people were getting used to me, no one would actually touch me. I didn't realize this at first because it's not like the kids go around touching each other that much in middle school anyway. Uh, but last th Thursday in dance class, which is like my least favorite class, Mrs. Atanabi, the teacher, tried to make Simena Chin be my dance partner. Now, I've never actually seen someone have a panic attack before, but I have heard about it, and I'm pretty sure Simena had a panic attack uh, at that second. She got really nervous and turned pale and literally broke into a sweat within a minute, and then she came up with very with some lame excuse about really having to go to the bathroom. Anyway, Mrs. Atanabi let her off the hook because she ended up not making anyone dance together. Then yesterday in my science elective, we were doing this cool mystery powder investigation where we had to classify a substance as an acid or a base. Everyone had to heat their mystery powders on a heating plate and make observation. So we will all huddle around the powders with our notebooks. Now there were there are eight kids in the elective, and seven of them were squished together on one side of the plate, while one of them, me, had loads of room on the other side. So of course I noticed this, but I was hoping Mrs. Rubin would notice this because I didn't want her to say something. But of course she noticed this, and of course she said something. Guys, there are plenty of room on that side. Tristan, you know, go over there, she said. So Tristan and Nino scooted over to my side. Tristan and Nino have always been okay, nice to me. I want to go on record as saying that. Not super nice, like they go out of their way to hang out with me, but okay, nice. Like they say hello to me and talk to me like normal. And they didn't even make a face when Mrs. Miss Rubin told them to come on my side which a lot of kids do when they think I'm not looking. Anyway, everything was going fine until this mystery powder started melting. He moved his foil off the plate just as my powder began to melt too, which is why I went to move mine off the plate. And then my hand accidentally bumped his hand for a fraction of a second. Tristan jerked his hand away so fast he dropped his foil on the floor while also knocking everyone else's foil off the heating plate. Tristan, yelled Miss Rubin, but Tristan didn't even care about the spilled powder on the floor or that he ruined the experiment. What he had most concerned about was getting to the lap sink to wash his hands as fast as possible. That's when I know for sure, when I knew for sure that there were was this thing about touching me at teacher prep. I think it's like the cheese touch in the diary of a wimpy kid. The kids in that story were afraid they would catch the cooties if they touched the old moldy cheese on the basketball court. At teacher prep, I am the old moldy cheese. Chapter 29, Customs. For me, Halloween is the best holiday in the world. It even beats Christmas. I got to dress up in a costume, I got to wear a mask, I got to go around like every other kid with a mask, and nobody thinks I look weird. Nobody takes me a second look, nobody notices me, nobody knows me. I wish every day could be Halloween. We could all wear a mask all the time. Then we could walk around and get to know each other before we got to see what we look like under the mask. When I was little, I used to wear an astronaut helmet everywhere I want I went to the playground to the supermarket to pick me up from school even in the middle of the summer though it was so hot my face would sweat I think I worked for a couple of years but I had to stop wearing it when I had my eye surgery I was about seven I think and then we couldn't find the helmet after that mom looked everywhere for it she figured that it had probably ended up in Grand's attic, and she kept meaning to look for it, but by then I had gotten used to not wearing it. I had pictures of me in all my Halloween costumes. My first Halloween I was a pumpkin, my second I was tiger, 
My third as was Peter Pan. My dad dressed up as Captain Hook. My fourth I was Captain Hook. My dad dressed up as Peter Pan. My fifth I was an astronaut. My sixth I was Obi Wan Kenobi. Kenobi. My seventh I was a clone trooper. My eighth I was Darth Vader. My ninth I was the Bleeding Scream, the one that has fake blood oozing out over the school mask. This year I'm going to be Boba Fett. Not Boba Fett, the kid in Star Wars Episode Two, Attack of the Clones. But Boba Fett, the the man from Star Wars Episode Five, The Empire Strikes Back. Mom searched area for the costume, but I but couldn't find one in my size, so she bought me a Jango Fett costume. Since Jango was Boba's dad and wore the same armor, and then painted the armor green, she did some other stuff to do it to make it look worn too. Anyway, it looks totally real. Real, Mom's built customs. In homeroom, we all talked about what we were going to be for Halloween. Charlotte's going as Har Har Hermione from Harry Potter. Jack was going at a government. I heard that Julian was going as J that Julian was going as Django Fat, which was a weird coincidence. I don't think he'll lie hearing that I was going at Boba Fat on the morning of Halloween. Via has this big crying meltdown about something. Via's always been so calm and cool. But this year, she's had a couple of these kind of fits. Jess was late for work and was like, "Via, let's go, let's go." Usually, Jess is super patient about things, but not when it comes to his being late for work. And his yelling just stretched out Via even more, and she started crying louder. So Mom told Dad to take me to school, and thus she deal with Via. Then Mom kissed me goodbye quickly, before I even put on my costume and disappeared into Via's room. Aki, let's go now," said Dad. "I have a meeting. I can't be late for. I haven't put my costume yet on on yet, so put it on already. Five minutes. You met you outside. I rushed to my room and started to put on the Boba Fett costume." But all of a sudden, I didn't feel like wearing it. I'm not sure why. Maybe because it had all this belt that needed to be tied, and I needed to, someone help to put it on. Or maybe it's because it still smelled a little like paint. All I knew was that it was a lot of work to put the the costume on, and that's what waiting and could get super impatient if I made him late. So, at the last minute, I threw on bleeding scream costume from last year. It was such an easy costume, just a long black robe and a big white mask. I yelled goodbye from the door on my way down, but Mom didn't even hear me. I thought you were going as Django Fat, said Dad when I got outside. Boba Fat, whatever, said Dad. This is a better costume anyway. Yeah, it's cool. I answer. Chapter Thirty: The Bleeding Scream. Walking through the halls that morning on my way to the lockers was, I have to say, absolutely awesome. Everything was different now. I was different. Where I usually walk with my head down, trying to avoid being seen. Today I walk with my head up, looking around. I wanted to be seen. One kid wearing the same exact costume as mine, long white scarfay, oozing fake red blood, high five it, high five me, and we walk past each each other on the stairs. I have no idea who he was, and he have no idea who I was. And I wondered for a second if he would have ever done that if he know it was me under the mask. I was starting to think this was going down as one of the most awesome days in the history of my life. But then I got to the home room. The first custom I saw as I walked inside the door was dark, serious. It had one of the rubber masks that was that are so realistic, with a big black hood over the head and a long black robe. 
I knew right away it was Julian, of course. He must change his costume at the last minute because he thought I was coming at Jungle Fat. He was talking to two mummies who ha- must have been Miles and Henry, and they were all kind of looking at the door like they were waiting for someone to come through it. I knew it wasn't a big scream they were looking for. It was a Boba Fett. I was going to go and sit at my usual desk, but for some reason, I don't know why, I found myself walking over to a desk near them and I could hear them talking. One of the mummies was saying, It really does look like him, like this part especially, answered Julian's voice. He put his finger on the cheeks and eye of his dark studio mask. Actually, said the mummy, what he really looks like, like one of those shrunken head. Have you ever seen though? He looked exactly like that. I think he's look like an orc. Oh yeah, if I look like that, said the Julian boy, kind of locking. I swear to God, I put a hood over my face every day. I've thought about this a lot, said the second mummy, starting serious. And I really think, if I look like him, seriously, I think that I kill myself. You would not answer Dark Sidious. Yeah, for real, insisted the same mummy. I can imagine looking in the mirror every day and seeing myself like that. It would be too awful and getting started at, and getting stared at all the time. Then why do you hang out with him so much? Asked Dark Sidious. I don't know, answered the mummy. Touchman asked me to hang out with him at the beginning of the year, and he must have told all the teachers to put us next to each other in all our classes or something. The mummy struck. I knew the struck, of course. I knew the boy. I knew I wanted to run out of the class right then and there. But I stood there where I was and listened to Rack. Jack will finish what he was saying. I mean, the thing is, he always follow me around. What am what am I supposed to do? Just ditch him, said Julian. I don't know what Jack answered because I walked out of the class without everyone knowing I had been there. My face felt like it was on fire while I walked back down the stairs. I was sweating under my costume and I started crying. I couldn't keep it from happening. The tears were so thick in my eye I could barely see, but I couldn't whip them through the mask as I walked. I was looking for a tiny spot to disappear into. I wanted a hole I could fall inside of, a little black hole that would eat me up. Chapter 31 Names Red Boy, Freak, Monster, Freddy Krueger, E.T., Grubs Out, Bizarre face, mutant, I know all the names they call me. I've been in enough playgrounds to know kids can be mean. I know, I know, I know. I end up in the second floor bathroom. No one was there because the first parrot had stopped and everyone was in class. I locked the door to my stall and took off my mask and just cried for I don't know how long. Then I went to the nurse's office and told her I had a stomach ache. It was true, because I feel like I had been kicked out the gut. Nurse Molly called mom and had me lying down on the sofa next to her desk. Fifteen minutes later, mom was at the door. Sweetness, she said, coming over to hug me. Hi, I mumbled. I didn't want her to ask anything until afterward. You have a stomach ache? She asked, automatically putting her hand on my forehead to check for my temperature. He said he feels like throwing up, said Nurse Molly, looking at me with very nice eyes. And I have a headache, I whispered. I wonder if it is something you ate, said Mom, looking worried. There's a stomach bug going around, said Nurse Molly. Oh jeez, said mom, her eyebrows going up as she shook her head. She helped me with she helped me to my feet. Should I call a taxi? Are you okay walking home? I can walk. What a brave kid, said Nurse Molly, patting me on the back as she walked towards the door. 
If he starts throwing up or runs a temperature, you should call the doctor. Absolutely, said mom, shaking nurse Molly's hand. Thank you so much for taking care of him. My pleasure, answered nurse Molly, putting her hand under my chin and tilting my face up. You take care of yourself, okay? I nodded and mumbled. Thank you. Mom and I hugged the whole way home. I didn't tell her anything about what had happened and after when she asked me if I felt well enough to go trick or treating after school, I said no. This worried her since she knew how much I usually love trick or treating. I heard her saying to dad on the phone, he doesn't even have the energy to go trick or treating. No, no fever at all. Mm, well, if he doesn't feel better by tomorrow, I will. I know, poor thing. Imagine he's missing Halloween. I got out of school. I got out of going to school the next day too, which was Friday. So I had the whole weekend to think about everything. I was pretty sure I'd never go back to school again. Part 2. Fear Far above the war, planet Earth is blue, and there's nothing I can do. David Bowie, Spay or DT Chapter 32. A Two of the Galaxy August is the sun. Me and mom and dad are planets orbiting the sun. The rest, about families and friends, are asteroids and comets floating around the planets orbiting the sun. The only celestial body that doesn't orbit or guess the sun is Daisy the dog. And that's only because to her little doggy eyes. Or guess face doesn't look very different from any other human's face. To Daisy, all our faces look alike, as flat and pale as the moon. I'm used to the way this universe works. I've never mind it's because it's all I have ever known. I've always understood that. Orcus is special and has special needs. If I was playing too loudly and he was trying to take a nap, I knew I would have to play something else because he needed his rest after some procedures or other had left him weak and in pain. If I wanted mom and dad to watch me play soccer, I knew that 9 out of 10 times they would miss it because they were busy settling Orcus to speech therapy or physical therapy or a new specialist or a surgery. Mom and Dad would always say I was the most understanding little girl in the world. I don't know how I don't know about that. Just that I understood there was no point in complaining. I've seen Orcus after his surgery, his little face bandaged up and swollen, his tiny body full of IVs and tubes to keep it alive. After you have seen someone else going through that. It feels kind of crazy to complain over not getting the toy you had asked for, or your mom missing a school play. I knew this even when I was 6 years old. No one ever told it to me. I just knew it. So I have gotten used to not complaining, and I have gotten used to not borrowing mom and dad with little stuff. I have gotten used to figuring things out on my own, how to put toys together, how to organize my life, so I don't miss friends' birthday parties, how to stay on top on my, of my schoolwork, so I never fall behind class. I have never asked for help with my homework, never needed reminding to finish a project or study for a test. If I was having trouble with a subject in school, I would go home and study it until I figured it out on my own. I taught myself how to convert fractions into decimal point by going online. I have done every school project pretty much by myself. When mom and dad ask me how things are going in school, I've always said, good, even when it hasn't always been so good. My worst day was four, good hot cake, was bruised, good cramps, was mean things anyone could say has always been nothing compared to what our guest had gone through. This isn't me being noble, by the way. It's just the way I know it is. And this is the way it's always been for me, for the little universe of us. But this year, 
There seems to be a shift in the cosmos. The galaxy is changing. Planets are falling out of alignment. Chapter 33 Before August I honestly don't remember my life before August came into it. I look at pictures of me as a baby and I see mom and dad smiling so happily, holding me. I can't believe how much younger they looked back then. Dad was this hipster dude and mom was this cute Brazilian fashionista. There's one shot of me at my third birthday. That's right behind me and while mom's holding the cake with three lit candles. And in back of us are Tata and Papa, Grants, Uncle Ben, Aunt Kate and Uncle Pooh. Everyone's look at, looking at me and I'm looking at the cake. You can see in that picture how I really was the first child, first grandchild, first niece. I don't remember what it feel like, of course, but I can see it plain as can be in the pictures. I don't remember the day they brought August home from the hospital. I don't remember what I said or did or felt when I saw him for the first time. Though everyone has a story about it, apparently I just looked at him for a long time without saying anything at all. And then finally I said, it doesn't look like Lily. That was the name, that was the name of a dog Grant had given me when mom was pregnant so I could practice being a big sister. It was one of those dolls that are incredibly lifelike and I had carried it everywhere for months, changing, changing its diaper, feeding it. I'm told I even made a baby sling for it. The story goes that after my initial reaction to August, it, took, it only took a few minutes according to Rance or a few days according to mom before I was over him, kissing him, cuddling him, baby talking to him. After that, I never so much as touched or mentioned Lily ever again. Chapter 34 Seeing August I never used to see August the way other people saw him. I knew he didn't look exactly normal, but I really didn't understand why strangers seemed so shocked when they saw him, horrified, sickened, scared. There are so many words I can use to describe the looks on people's faces, and for a long time I didn't get it. I just get mad. Mad when they stared, mad when they looked away. What the heck are you looking at? I, I would say to people, even grown-ups. Then when I was about 11, I went to stay with Grant in Montauk for four weeks while August was having his big jaw surgery. This was the longest I had ever been away from home. And I have to say it was so amazing to suddenly be free of all the stuff that, that made me so mad. No one stared at Grant and me when we went to buy grocery. No one pointed at us. No one even noticed us. Grants were one of those grandmothers who do everything with their grandkids. She would run into the ocean if I asked her to, even if she had nice gold on. She would let me play with her makeup and didn't mind if I used it on her face to practice my face painting skills. She'd, she'd take me for ice cream even if we hadn't eaten dinner yet. She would draw chalk horses on the sidewalk in front of her house. One night, while we were walking back from town, I told her that I wished I could live with her forever. I was so happy that I think it might have been the best time in my life. Coming at home after four weeks felt very strange at first. I remember very vividly stepping through the door and seeing August running over to welcome me home. And for this tiny fraction of a moment, I saw him not the way I've always seen him. 
but the way other people see him. It was only a flash, an instant while he was hugging me, so happy that I was home, but it surprised me that because I had never seen him like that before, and I had never felt what I was feeling before either, a feeling I had to myself for having a moment I hadn't. But as he was kissing me with all his heart, all I could see was the drone coming down his chin, and suddenly there I was, like all those people who would stare or look away, horrified, sickened, scared. Thankfully, that only lasted for a second. The moment I heard August laugh, his raspy little laugh, it was over. Everything was back the way it had been before, but it had opened a door for me, a little peephole, and on the other side of the peephole there were two August, the one I saw blinding, and the one other people saw. I think the, the only person in the world I could have told any of this to was Grant, but I didn't. It was too hard to explain over the phone. I thought maybe she came for Thanksgiving. I would tell her what I felt. But just two months after I stayed with her in Montauk, my beautiful Grant died. It was so completely out of the blue. Only she had she had checked herself into the hospital because they'd been feeling nauseous. Mom and I drove out to see her, but it's a three hour drive from where we live. And by the time we got to the hospital, Grant was gone. A heart attack, they told us just like that. It's so strange how one day you cannot be on this earth, and the next day not. Where did she go? Will I really ever see her again? Or is that a fairy tale? You see movies and TV shows where people receive horrible news in hospital. But for us, with all our many trips to the hospital with August, there has always been good outcomes. What I remember the most from the days Grant died is Mom Reed literally crumbling to the floor in slow, heavy sobs, holding her stomach like someone had just punched her. I've never ever seen Mom like that, never heard sounds like that come out of her. Even through all of August's surgeries, Mom always put on a brave face. On my last day in Montauk, Grant and I have had watched the sunset on the beach. We had taken a blanket to sit on, but it had gotten chilly, so we wrapped it around us and cuddled and talked until there wasn't even a sliver of sun left over the, the ocean. And then Grant told me she had a secret to tell me. She loved me more than anyone else in the world. Even August, I had asked. She smiled and stroked my hair like she was thinking about what to say. I love Augie very, very much, she said softly. I can still remember her Portuguese accent, the way she rolled her arms. Uh, but he has many angles looking out for him already, Bia. And I want you to know that you have me looking out for you, okay? Menina Corrida, I want you to know that you are number one for me. You are my... She looked out at the ocean and spread her hand down like she was trying to smooth out the wave. You are my everything. You understand me, Bia? Who has more to do? I understood her and I knew why she said it was a secret. Grandmothers aren't supposed to have favorites. Everyone knows that. But after she died, I held on to that second. It's so strange how one day you cannot be on this earth, and the next day not. Where did she go? Will I really ever see her again? Or is that a fairy tale? You see movies and TV shows where people receive horrible news in hospital. But for us, 
with all our many trips to the hospital with August, there has always been good outcomes. What I remember the most from the day's grand diet is Mom read literally crumbling to the floor in slow, heavy sobs, holding her stomach like someone had just punched her. I've never ever seen Mom like that. Never heard sounds like that come out of her. Even through all of August surgeries, all of August surgeries, Mom always put on a brave face. On my last day in Montauk, Rance and I have had watched the sunset on the beach. We had taken a blanket to sit on, but it had gotten chilly, so we wrapped it around us and cuddled and talked until there wasn't even a sliver of sun left over the, the ocean. And then Grant told me she had a secret to tell me. She loved me more than anyone else in the world. Even August, I had asked. She smiled and stroked my hair like she was thinking about what to say. I love Augie very, very much, she said softly. I can still remember her Portuguese accent, the way she wrote her art. Uh, but he has many angles looking out for him already, Via. And I want you to know that you have me looking out for you, okay? Melina Corrida, I want you to know that you are number one for me. You are my. She looked out at the ocean and spread her hand down like she was trying to smooth out the wave. You are my everything. You understand me, Via? To ask more to do. I understood her and I knew why she said it were a secret. Grandmothers aren't supposed to have favorites. Everyone knows that. But after she died, I held on to the secret and let it cover me like a blanket. Chapter 36, High School What I always loved most about middle school was that it was separate and different from home. I could go there and be Olivia Perman, not Via, which is my name at home. Via was what they called me in elementary school too. Back then, everyone knew all about us, of course. Mom used to pick, pick me up after school and August was always in the stroller. There wasn't a lot of people who were equipped to babysit for Oki, so mom and dad brought him to all my class plays and courses and recitals, all the school functions and the bake sales and the book fairs. My friends knew him, my friend's parents knew him, my teachers knew him, the janitor knew him. Hey, how you going, Oki? He'd always say and give August a high five. August was something of a fixture at PS22. But in middle school, a lot of people didn't know about August. My old friends did, of course, but, but my new friend didn't. Or if they knew, it wasn't necessarily the first thing they knew about me. Maybe it was the second or third thing they'd heard about me. Olivia? Yeah, she's nice. Did you hear, did you hear she has a brother who's deformed? I always hate that word, but I knew it was how people describe Augie, and I knew those kinds of conversations probably happen all the time out of ear earshot. Every time I left, the I left the room at the party or bump into groups of friends at the pizza place, and that's okay. I'm always going to be the sister of a kid with a birth defect. That's not the issue. I just don't always want to be defined that way. The best thing about high school is that hardly anybody know me at all, except Miranda and Ella, of course, and they know not to go around talking about it. Miranda, Ella, and I have known each other since the first grade. What's so nice if we never have to explain things to one another. When I decided I wanted them to call me Olivia instead of Pia, they got it without my having to explain. They've known August since he was a baby. When we were little, our favorite thing to do was play to was to play dress up with Augie, load him up with feather bows and big hats and Hana modern wings. He used to love it, of course, and we thought he was adorably cute in his own way. Ella said he reminded her of 
E-T. She didn't say this to be mean, of course, though maybe it was a little bit mean. The truth is, there's a sense in the movie when Drew Baby Moore dresses E.T. in a blonde wig, and that was a ringer for Augie in our Millie Sellers heyday. Hey day. Throughout middle school, Miranda, Ella, and I were pretty much our own little group. Somewhere between super popular and well liked, not brainy, not jokes, not rich, not drug dis, not mean, not goody goody, not hug, not huge, not flat. I don't know if the three of us found each other because we were so alike in so many ways, or that because we found each other. We've become so alike in so many ways. We were so happy when we all go got into funky high school. It was such a long shot that all three of us would be accepted, especially when almost no one else from middle school was. I remember how we screamed into our phones the day we got our acceptance letters. That is why I haven't understood what's been going on with us lately. Now that we've actually in high school, it's nothing like how I how I thought it would be.